Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Better Advertising with Better AMS podcast. Today, I am super excited to have the one and only Brian Porter from Simple Modern on here today. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. It's it's an honor, and I've, I've enjoyed following you on LinkedIn, so I, I'm excited for the conversation. Yeah, of course, and the same could be said for you. Uh, I think you do a fantastic job of bringing a brand angle to LinkedIn. I mean, we, we know all the agencies and the software providers are posting a ton of content, but I think you're one of the people similar to Sean Riley, who's just stepped up and built a fantastic brand that's very much built on transparency and the difficulties you've had scaling Simple Modern. Yeah, well, I, I think we're unique in the way that we like to share information about our brand. We, we, don't, we don't really get nervous about people like figuring out our secrets and competing with us because there, there's more of a um, angle to, to building a brand where you, you see what your brand needs and you react to that. And so I don't think there's like one size fits all advice that's going to give someone a leg up. But I'm I'm hopeful that what I share is helpful in giving other brand owners and agencies ideas on how to, to better operate their business. Most definitely. And, you know, looking externally at everything you've built, in my opinion, one of the things that you've done best is honed in on that brand angle. I mean, you're taking products that, you know, people always stress about those categories. You know, there's a, a million different Chinese sellers hopping in or, you know, lowering prices, but you've done such a great job of turning your brand into something that people love. Uh, what does that look like on your end? How do you go into your R&D and say, hey, this is going to be something that's going to mean something to someone? That is a really good question. And it's it's very, there's a very long answer to it. I'll try and make it shorter. <laughs> um, so we started in the Amazon marketplace about eight years ago. And whenever we started, certainly like we didn't have a brand and that's kind of the beauty of Amazon is you have the reviews that can kind of get you past not having a brand. And so starting off, it was very much creating listings that were very low price, um, trying to figure out how to add certain elements to the listing to make it convert better than other listings. So it was very tactical and there was really no branding at all on day one. Um, over time, what we've realized is that if you want to be in business for a long time, you really need to build a brand because that's the only thing that can't be copied on Amazon um, unless you have really great IP. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, over time, we, we realized that we were growing a small customer base kind of every year. We were growing this snowball of, of people who weren't looking for water bottles anymore. They were looking for Simple Modern. And so whenever you do that for over five years, you actually start to get a pretty large percent of your purchasing through repeat customers. And that's when you can start to uh, focus less on price and focus more on delivering what people really want. And um, that I, I think the combination of having customers who are looking for you specifically, um, a lot of listings with a lot of reviews give your brand right. even for someone who hasn't heard of it a lot of um trust um and you know you you, you can't fabricate having like 10 listings with thousands of reviews yeah. that are you know four and a half five star so really like over time we've we've been able to kind of morph what was not a brand at all right. and not a brand strategy into one and nowadays, nowadays, we're doing product launches just for our website. We're trying to create new products that are unique and different, um, not just replicating what's out there. So um, th those are a lot of the factors that go into the brand. I, I think high level, something that's been important for us is the idea that like no one's going to care about our brand more than us. So it starts with us valuing our own brand and saying no to places like Walmart whenever they want to put our product on shelves at this really low price. Like, we don't need that. Yep. Um, we want to be at our MSRP and you can take it or leave it, Walmart. And a lot of times they say no and they end up coming back a few months later and saying, ah, okay, 
<laughs> we'll take it. So there's, there's things like that where you kind of got to put your foot in the ground right. at some point and yeah. say, like, my brand means something. It's worth something. Yeah. And customers are willing to pay for it. Right. If, if you never do that, then you're never really going to have, like, the brand that I think you can hang your hat on and, and yeah. that can be the, the advantage that you want it to be. There, there's a little bit of a philosophical answer yeah. there. And I think we've done a lot on our end as well as if you're constantly just chasing the revenue aspect, then you do. You get caught up in all the little details of like what's my margin on this specific product for this year or organic rank or chasing those kind of short term KPIs. But something we've really started speaking to our brands about is what are your long term goals on Amazon? Like, what are you trying to achieve as a brand overall? And then try to back into some of those KPIs, because we always see, especially people who started native on Amazon, the platform's changed so much in the last seven years. You know, back then, competition was so much lower. You could launch a brand and have a, you know, 30 cent CPC and make things work. But nowadays, you really have to back into those angles and know what you're trying to accomplish over the next one, two, three years and keep that vision in mind. I think that's the biggest thing. When you have that vision, it's a lot easier to say no to all the different shiny objects that are being released and all of those things. Yeah, no doubt. And and really having that long-term view is, is a huge advantage that we've seen. Um, whenever we identify a product that we think that we can make and bring to market and capture um, you know, top-level market share, it, it doesn't matter what our profitability is year one. Like What matters is creating an annuity over the next five to 10 years. So you can do something like, um, you know, run heavy, ad, whatever you need in, in ads to, to get the product seen. Um, you can run deals, like any, any lever that you can think of, like, in my opinion, you should do to try and get your product to the top of rankings. Um, and if, if you're too focused on profitability, the risk is that you never achieve the organic ranking that you, yep. you actually could achieve. And um, you're, you're just limiting your upside. So there, there, in terms of risk reward, there's so much more reward in being aggressive with product launches and having that long-term mindset. With everything that you all have built in terms of kind of that loyal audience and what you're doing off platform and in retail and Amazon, do you have a favorite? What's your, what's your favorite project to deep dive in within the company when you're hands on keyboard? Uh, that's a great question. We have a lot of really fun projects. Um, so a few that come to mind as it pertains to branding is that we're, we're thinking about things now like with our um, product pages on Amazon and our website. Whenever we launched, it was all about how do we convince the customer to buy our product. So you're showing features, trying to like communicate your value prop, all that stuff. And it's really evolved for us into like quality of content more than explaining and the convincing. So I'm, I'm a believer at this point that like our, our imagery, whether it's static images, lifestyle image, studio images, video, um, 3D content, the, the quality of that kind of imputes quality onto our product whenever our customers get it because it forms that expectation in their mind. And in some ways it, it kind of convinces them before they get our product that our product is really high quality. Yeah. The, the same thing goes with packaging, um, something that's kind of new to us in, in the year 2023 versus 2015 is influencer videos and <laughs> unboxing videos. If someone's pulling a, a really awesome product out of this just ugly box, it, it takes away from that experience. Even though it's a small thing and they're going to throw it away, like it, it actually matters. Yeah. Um, and, and we used to ship our products from our 3PL for, for our website, just with a label on our product box, we wouldn't put an additional box around it. And the, the product would be fine, but the box would be really dirty, kind of banged up. And, you know, in the TikTok video, no one's wanting to like show that off. <laughs> Slide that to the side. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, whenever you open an iPhone, like you, do, you don't even want to throw yes, away the so iPhone not. box because it's, yes, it's so Yes, it's beautiful. so nice. Yep. So really creating that experience is a big part, um, both on your product pages and your packaging. And um, so, so that's something that we're really focused on. And I would say the, the other thing that I'm really passionate about now 
is I don't want to sell anything that I wouldn't want like my mom to buy. Yeah. Or, you know, my wife or my best friend. Yep. Like I want I want to be proud of the products that we sell. And we've sold things in the past that honestly, like it wouldn't pass that test. So we spend a lot more time now on product dev. And yeah. you know, whether it sells a ton or not, I think if we're if we're proud of what we're making and creating, like there's value there. Um even for like us internally, knowing that yeah. we're creating things that we think are amazing and that people would like. Yeah. Um, we can live with the results if we're doing that. <laughs> with all of these different aspects of your business, you know, from packaging and user experience and social and content, how have you built a team and how has that team changed over time? I mean, there's so many different things that you could focus on that can make a brand successful. How have you balanced when to make that investment proactively into, hey, let's go ahead and change our pra- our packaging, knowing margins are maybe lower, but now we are more TikTokable. How does how does that balance work with scaling a company? It's been a slow process throughout the years. We have to get ourselves out of the mindset that we were in when we launched. We we tend to get stuck in certain ways. Um, an example right now that I think is is helpful is that early on we were really aggressive and not disciplined on inventory buying, mm-hmm. and then we hired a bunch of uh, people who are great at finance, <laughs> and they really got our inventory health into into fantastic shape. So we went from one ditch to the other, and I, I think the perfect spot to be in with your inventory planning is somewhere in the middle where you're aggressive, but also smart with how you're, you're buying inventory. And so we, we kind of shifted all the way over into this more conservative method where it's like, well, I don't know if I want to buy this one product that we think customers would like because it's not additive to our total sales. It's going to take from this other product that we're selling. And that, that's really not helpful to our, our overall business because essentially you're saying, our customers are happy enough with this one product that we sell. We're not going to give them exactly what they want. So that's an area where we've had to be open-minded and be willing to, to, to change how we approach things with where we are in the business. So allowing kind of those two tensions to pull and, and meeting somewhere in the, in the middle has been helpful. Um, and I think another good example here is with product dev. In the beginning, we took stuff off the shelf in China and put our logo on it, moved really fast, and it did well. Like, it did well enough for us to get traction. (laughs) But there was a point where we realized, like, if if all we're doing is taking product off shelf and it's not unique, like, that's not a brand. You're not creating anything that customers are looking for specifically. So there was kind of a flag in the ground moment where we said, like, we're only going to sell things from now on that we have developed in-house, and we're going to actively phase out of everything that looks like just a straight dupe or knockoff of something else, um, which was hard at the time because it, it it takes longer to create something yeah. yourself than look through a catalog and say, I want that. <laughs> that one. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it's uh, some something that is creating... Um, uniqueness aesthetically and practically that that customers like and they want to search for. It's interesting uh, hearing you talk kind of about the entrepreneurial side of that journey of like, yeah, we got started on Amazon and we figured out Amazon and we picked these products. And then you kind of start, as you get more experience and more reps, you start honing in on like what part's most enjoyable? What part are we best at? And then you kind of just start building out the team below that supports everything that's not enjoyable or that what you're not best at. But when you do focus on that vision and you start figuring out what that vision is as you do more and more, I think it all becomes so much easier. I mean, we're obviously not in the product-based business, but I've been in Amazon for seven years now. And when I started, I got thrown in and I was like, yeah, this is interesting. I'm going to keep doing it. But if you would have told me, you know, seven years from that first PPC campaign I launched that I would be, you know, leading a lot of the content and education and have a full team and be the CEO, I would have never believed you. But it's so easy to get caught up in 
you know, that five, 10 year stress planning, but sometimes you just got to show up and figure it out and iterate as you go, especially in e-commerce because the industry changes so quick and I think it makes it fun for us, but uh, keeping up with it's not always easy. Yeah. Yeah, that that's true. And I, I think what happens over time is that you either create competencies or um, for us, we grow email lists or social followings or just people who want to buy again. And all of a sudden you have leverage that you never had yeah. before. And it allows yes. you to do new things that you, you couldn't do in the beginning. So it, it definitely does change over time. That's a that's a fantastic point that I think a lot of people uh, forget about is just the timing it takes to get there. Like you have to do the hard things up front. Like I always laugh when you read uh, any entrepreneurial book or take any entrepreneur tips. It says, you know, you have to be good at saying no. 100% I feel the same way with my time now. But my first two years, I had to say yes to everything. I said yes to every podcast, webinar, speaking engagement, every client that came our way. Because we needed that leverage in order for me to be able to say no. So also aligning kind of that strategic advice you get with where you're at in the business is something that's super important. And same thing on the Amazon side. In the beginning, I think you do have to be so much more conscious of margin because it's typically, you know, a solopreneur reinvesting in all of their inventory. But in order to go from, you know, that seven-figure brand to that eight-figure brand, there's a major mindset change that has to happen. You have to start thinking so much more long-term and investing in the vision of your company. And that's that's a big thing we typically see sellers struggle with that happened on the platform for a while. They don't make that switch to brand like you did. Yeah, it, it's a tough transition. And a transition that we're trying to make right now is a brand that's been bootstrapped and cash strapped for, you know, seven plus years. We're starting to to produce cash flow and be able to, you know, dream more of, of how we want to use excess cash to fuel the business. And because of, of being cash constrained, we've we've really leaned into organic re mass retail mm -hmm. as our distribution. And so advertising marketing is really kind of outside of our wheelhouse and we're, we're having to learn how to do that in a way that's effective. So that, that's an example of a way that we're still being pushed to pivot. And I yeah. think the next leg of our growth is right. going to be more through advertising than yeah. it ever has been. Yep. Oh, so can we officially kick off my favorite topic here? And <laughs> I'm going to give a shout out to this LinkedIn post because I have shared it with pretty much every single person in my network. You know, a lot of my job is just viewing the long-term evolution of Amazon advertising. It's speaking to brands, it's educating, it's showing them what all is possible. And a lot of people, especially sellers who have been on the platform for a while, have that love-hate relationship with Amazon PPC. Well, you posted the brand perspective of what happens when you turned off your ads. And it was very transparent. I'm pretty sure something along the lines of we didn't see much of a drop short term. We did start seeing a slight effect to our organic ranking, you know, month over month. But it it took, what, 45 to 60 days before you even started to see that. And it was just a fantastic post. And I think, one, you guys do an amazing job of driving traffic externally. So you're maybe less reliant on just Amazon PPC because you've built that brand. But. I want to hear more about that journey and that post, which made me the number one advocate of everything you all are doing. And I'll drop the link in the show notes here. But I want to hear about your experience with just Amazon advertising and Meta and all of the different variables and kind of where you're at with that. Well, I'm glad that that was a helpful <laughs> post. I think it made some people angry. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, you, you always do on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a rule of having viral content is. Yes. You, you you get some unpleasant replies if that happens. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. I, I think it was it was either the summer of, of 20 or 21 that we did this. I should know the answer to that. But essentially, we had used Amazon advertising pretty aggressively when scaling up the business. There were time periods in 2018, 2019, where we ran at 10%, 10 percent, 10 percent of our retail sales were spent in advertising with Amazon. For us, that was a lot because we run at low margins. And we we really had the, the, the realization that Amazon shows you certain ROAS, certain performance. And 
there's so much more to it than what your row has is in <laughs> Amazon advertising. Um, we didn't quite understand the the differences between like branded type search terms, competitor search terms, generic search terms. And, you know, there's nuances even on generic search terms. If you're ranked number one on yep. something like water bottle, <laughs> like how helpful is it really to have yeah. advertisements or sponsored products showing up around that spot? Um, I, I think at this point, point. in in my... Um, exploration of, of of advertising i think it's somewhere around maybe 70 percent incremental on on a search term like that mm -hmm. like it is helpful but there's a certain uh, amount of customers that would have bought anyway yep so okay so that's that's kind of the the, the background we turned off our ad campaign completely because we dug into yeah, yeah, to yeah. some of these things and we had a a sinking feeling that we were just wasting our money that we could be using buying like inventory or making new products or whatever. Um, so like you said, we turned it off for three months. Um, I, I think that if we never turned it back on, we would still have a company and we would still be <laughs> That's doing always okay. a good thing. <laughs> so like we don't think that we have to do it. Yep. We think that it is a catalyst for growing our customer base for having higher organic rankings and it's kind of an element of a flywheel. Um, so where we came out on the back end of that test, turning ads back on and kind of seeing what happened to our sales is the, yes, our, our top line revenue did go up. It didn't go up as much as Amazon ads said that it should have. <laughs> yep. Yep. So there, yeah, there's somewhere in the middle and, and digging in, um, I, I think the high level for us is that competitor advertising is the best advertising we can do because organically we're never going to rank in yep. the top 10 of any competitor unless it's it's just a weak competitor. Um, so I, that's where I want to spend my money first and foremost. Generic would be second. And there's a big power dynamic on generic keywords where you know your top 10 generic keywords are driving just a, you know 80% of your revenue so really focusing in on on those to me is is where the real value is there is value in the long tail but there's also a cost of like your time and complexity yeah. so we like to focus in, in the top keywords and then with branded we're, we're I've been running tests this year where I think that about 20% of our branded spend is actually incremental. Yep. And, yep. and really like the incremental sales on branded, I think for us come mostly through merchandising. Yep. So showing customers products that they probably don't want is yep. really the strategy. And we're happy for competitors to advertise on our keywords because we see that there's a big discrepancy between impression share on our branded keywords and click share. Yep. Like we get 70% of the impression share, but like 95% of the click share. So there, there's a lot of kind of placements there that customers are just not engaging with. Yeah. I would say there's a major education gap, I think, especially brand side to advertising side because of a lot of the callouts you had are fantastic callouts and I'm still having to break up a lot of those myths of, hey, this is what's possible here, here, and here. And I think it's because the industry changes as quick as it does and most, you know, founders probably aren't as close to Amazon or as passionate about Amazon. But we see the branded versus non-branded cannibalism, probably one of the biggest mistakes we see within accounts, as well as a lack of awareness of how granular you can get with Amazon advertising. So you mentioned segmenting out those keywords and really trying to think, you know, from the customer perspective, if a customer is typing in this, what does my share of shelf look like? And I think the next big step we're expecting to see in the market, and there's not a lot of tools or operations to make it easy of how do you have that unique assortment? If someone types in water bottle and your ASIN is ranked number one, number two, number three to four, how do you put four brand new products in the fir first four sponsored product ads? So now you're winning eight different placements on the shelf, right? Or how do you layer in that sponsored brand headline search ad? 
that is now advertising three products for the cost of one with a lifestyle image and with copy that maybe again is different from that organic assortment. I think a lot of brands are going to have to shift that way because we do see cannibalization between ads and organic. It's very similar to what you see on Google. So we're really trying to back into that. How do we take the organic data and overlap it with our advertising data to make sure for every keyword we have unique shelf assortment? And there's there's no great solution in this space. It's got to be really scrappy just due to what Amazon gives you from an API perspective. But understanding that funnel is so important. And I think Amazon's giving us more opportunity to also move up funnel. So when you talk about like how your brand is portrayed, how we utilize lifestyle and video and off platform, Amazon's wanting to take the audience insights that they have in terms of like path to purchase and incorporate it with what we're doing on PPC. And I think those things are also going to help a lot because now it's not just on search query. It's, hey, what's the demographic data behind that? And those things are exciting to me. Yeah. Yeah. That it's amazing looking at Amazon ads today compared to yeah. what it was like seven years ago. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot more data and insights. And I think the brand analytics tools that they've given has been probably the most helpful change that they've made in, in yeah. the last seven years that we've been selling on Amazon. But I, I do think to your point, like there, there is a ton of nuance with advertising. We sell licensed products and licensed product tends to have just tons of keywords. So broad uh, keywords too, typically it's like starting with Mickey yes. Mouse and then trying to figure out how you lead them down, like from the category terms. Like you almost can't play in that category game because it's so broad. Yes, that, it, it's a great point. A, a, an example of that that we've seen is that we sell pro, like bottles with characters from the movie Frozen on it. Uh huh. And we've learned that we can drive sales on Frozen toys as a keyword. And we sell a water bottle, not a toy. Yep. But it's relevant yep. enough to be able to get sales, but we're not rele relevant enough to rank organically on that that keyword. So yep. it's kind of this weird in between in terms of like relevancy. Yeah, and you don't want to spend a ton of money because like you you mentioned this earlier about the flywheel of the beauty of Amazon advertising is it does influence organic rank. So once you have a better understanding of what that relationship looks like, it helps you scale. So you take a term like Olaf toys and you don't necessarily want to invest in trying to rank in it. So you got to find that incremental pivotal point where, hey, this is profitable and driving sales, but we shouldn't go beyond that because we're not going to rank well organically for that term. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we sell fan shop as well. And uh -huh. so, you know, there's, there's some more examples there. Like Dallas Cowboys is the biggest keyword for that team. Yep. Well, that's pretty generic. And you're competing against like... <laughs> Five dollar uh, CPCs, top of search. <laughs> yeah, very expensive ad spots. You're competing against jerseys and like grill tools and snow globes and like yep. all sorts of random stuff. Yeah. So it, it's a pretty interesting space with ads, and I I, th I think that licensing is an area where ads are like uniquely helpful. Yeah. Um, since you are competing cross category with other brands. This is also, I think, where DSP becomes more exciting. Um, DSP is one of those other shiny objects in the Amazon space that I feel like has not been educated well enough. A lot of people don't realize the opportunities on DSP and or they were burned by DSP three to four years ago when it was a new tool and maybe not sold appropriately. But nowadays, being able to have the audience insights that Amazon does and say, you know, hey, this person bought a Dallas Cowboys jersey six months ago. Let's serve them with my water bottle ads. We know that they're a fan. And being able to layer in demographics of, hey, they're also within our age range and our income range. Those things, I think, are going to be a lot of what Amazon's focus is in the future. Because we know search has kind of come down to this pay to play because it is valuable real estate. Like, it's not Amazon arbitrarily increasing CPCs. Brands are willing to pay those CPCs because the real estate is so valuable. But you just can't compete sometimes. Like you said, you're not going to pay $5 for a Dallas Cowboy search term when you have something maybe a little bit more broad. So if we can start layering in the DSP aspects and everything we're doing on PPC and then using AMC on top of it, throwing out all the acronyms right now, <laughs> <laughs> I, think the, I think the future will get a lot more exciting because now we're having insane power to make sure we're hyper, hyper targeting. Yeah. And I'll be honest, we, I think, are one of the people that got burned by display ads back in the day. <laughs> yep. 
And we, we have trust issues with that type of advertising, like top of funnel advertising is yeah. something that I know is like legitimate and real, Yeah. but we are yeah. so much like our mindset's oh still very much, um, you know, direct response right. advertising. Yep. If you can't see it in the row as, yeah. then it feels yeah. like we're just kind of shooting money out into space. <laughs> so yeah. it, there's got to be a middle ground too. I think that was something that in my opinion... Uh, I could do a whole podcast on my opinions of how DSP was rolled out as a whole because we, we've we seen a lot of brands and I remember being pitched AMG like six years ago. It was Amazon Media Group at the time and it was like a $3 million package and they were like, you're getting impressions. And I was like, am I getting sales? They're like, no, but a million, a hundred million people are seeing it. So it's been a fun one to break through, but I think the power of DSP as a whole is there it's just making sure it's being utilized appropriately because i think you do have a very unique audience uh as a whole you have those licensee deals so being able to back into that like a a fun example i always use for example if i'm selling a car seat carrier the fact that i can target everyone who bought prenatals 12 months ago within a certain income range that's where it becomes powerful i think where you start moving too far up the funnel is when you start incorporating more off-platform targeting more streaming tv more of that style of methodology because it is still so heavily impression based and amazon hasn't given us an amazing way to tie it together to here's my dsp and here's my ppc amc definitely helps with that we have a high price point product that i was looking at the other day and it takes an, a customer an average of 17 views of a sponsored product ad to make a purchase And that's a really cool data to know because now we can back into, yes, it makes sense to have all these ad types and to continue running because we see the average customer needs to view this sponsored product ad 17 times before purchasing. And once we have more of those insights, I think it'll justify a little bit more of that upper funnel because then we'll know that our lower funnel is performing better. It's so true. And the the way that we've grown our brand, I think we've seen the, the downside of relying on organic Re, like mass retail selling like we sell in target and walmart on amazon and most of our customers are familiar with our brand from seeing us on search results or on shelves we we don't have those impressions that you're talking about brands right. like uh in our space corksicle yeti yep. um, hydro flask they have a lot better brand awareness than we do compared to how much we've sold we we've sold more than Corksicle has, but if you were to survey like nationwide, more people would be familiar with Corksicle than us, just as like a, a method of how they've sold their product. Yep. So that that's kind of been a recent unlock for us. Yep. There's like this value of of display advertising, or even like influencer advertising that's not direct response sales. Yep. It's somebody seeing your brand once. And then, you know, they may see it, see people carrying it around town, then they may see it in Target and buy it as a result of like those touch points. So there's no great way to track it. I mean, like you said, it could be something could go viral on TikTok and then their best friend happens to talk to them. Like you can never tie that awareness together. And I think that's what makes it so risky and such a difficult bet. You know, having... Having access to a platform like TikTok where things can just go viral makes it a little bit easier because now your content marketing costs are a little bit cheaper than paying for a billboard and expecting that awareness to work. But it, it's difficult because you don't necessarily have a way to back into where is this coming from? Why have I sold out in one day? Oh, number one influencer posted about me. And that's a kind of a scary place to be. And it, it's totally real. This year is the first year that we've experienced Um, influencer as a way of driving sales Mm -hmm. and fortunately for us it came about organically Um, we we created a product that um, really was like the second um, product of its type behind stanley's um, tumblr with handle and we we created ours to be to be better in a few different ways Um, aesthetically we think it's it's uh i don't know that that's an objective opinion but we think it looks really good (laughs) It leaks less, it's lighter, it's more comfortable to hold. And it's... it holds ice longer. If I have I think I saw this influencer campaign that maybe went viral. Okay. It was like it knocked all of them over. Is it uh-huh. this one? There's been a bunch of them. Okay. 
So I, I've that's, seen a that's few of them. Of yeah. Yeah. And, and we didn't pay for any of them. It's, it's really that we created a product that people thought was better that happens to be $15 cheaper and they feel compelled to either unbox it on TikTok or knock it over full of water compared to yep. Stanley and do, do those types of things. And it, it's really like transformed our brand. We're up like 80% year over year on Amazon. Our website's up like 400% really in large part due to, to these things. Um, it's in like Amazon search related, we have, uh, we, we got into the top hundred searches for like our brand name for just like a few days, which, you know, for us, it, it felt like that would be something that would never <laughs> even be possible. Yes. But yeah, it, it speaks to the power of, of, uh, virality on, on influencer and getting a ton of impressions. So it, it's been fun to, to see this year. I, I want to hit on something. Most people are going to go and take notes and be like, okay, work with TikTok influencers. But in my opinion, the real root of it was creating a product that people want to sell, that they want to influence their friends into purchasing because it's that much better. And I think all of it starts with the brand. People do care aesthetically about the products that they have. And also just creating that unboxing experience and piecing everything together, like playing on the psychology of influencers is where that really started and it helped brand, build that brand recognition, which is growing your D2C and on-platform sales. Yeah, and that's the only way that we've had success with influencer. We've tried like product seeding, and we've tried paying yep. a few influencers, and we we have not had nearly the the viral posts that we've had organically. So, so one thing I will tell you that that's really exciting and, and fun that we're doing at this point, uh, we we want to break into channels where you have to have higher margins and higher retails. Well, we built our brand on Amazon, so we don't have that with our <laughs> existing catalog. Um, but we're creating products that is going to be priced more in the like Yeti price point range. And the product is going to be like as decked out as possible with like as many features as we can have. Uh, this probably isn't helpful for people listening on a podcast, but <laughs> I'm, I'm holding one of the products right now. It's a, a coffee tumbler. It's got ceramic coating on the inside that can either be color matched or color accented. We've got like silicone on the bottom of it. We created a, a 360 lid just for this product line um, that we can do really fun things with or, ornamentation wise. Yeah. And so we're, we're pricing this product at $35. Yep. We sell the same thing without the ceramic coating on the inside. Um, without the 360 lid, without the silicone on bottom for around half the price on Amazon. So we're we're trying to to jump into like the D2C high-end retail world while still being like mass retail um, yeah. is kind of like in our DNA. And in doing that, like we could pay an influencer like 12 bucks a unit to sell one of these. Um, we, we cannot do that with any of our other products. And I, yep. I think that that's, hopefully going to be an unlock for us to incentivize influencers to, to really show off our products. And it also has like the features that they can yes. show off to justify it to, to, yeah, to get their cut, their audience engaged and excited about it. So that's, that's kind of the, the big thing that we're, we're trying to make the jump to brand wise, which is when is that exciting. launch slated? What, what month do we need to look for here? <laughs> so, we, we launched that product a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It's not available on Amazon, just our website. And we, we've been selling hundreds of them a day, which has been a lot uh, better than my expectations. Yeah. Part of that is that we can run it a two row as on marketing campaigns with it, which is very unprofitable with any anything else we sell. Yep. Um. We're also going to try and get these products, like I mentioned, in high-end retailers, places like Whole Foods or your local wherever that sells Corksicle and Yeti and that type of stuff. So I, I think we're going to run out of these in the next, uh, I don't know, two months. And then we're going to bring in another set that we're going to go heavy with Influencer on. Unfortunately, we can't do that right now because we just don't have enough inventory. <laughs> 
which, which makes a, me it's sad. It's a fine line. <laughs> I know. I, I get very impatient. I want to do it now. Well, that's amazing. Congratulations on the launch. I would love to bring you on for a 2.0 after we have, you know, six to 12 months of data and insights over how this went and what the different differences in price point and advertising strategies behind it looks like. I think that would be a fantastic follow up for the audience. For sure. I, I honestly am curious to see how it goes as well. So I don't think many brands are able to sell in mass retail and high end retail or, you know, Amazon and D to C like yeah. really well. The, I, and if you do, I think it's brands that started off in high end retail and moved into mass retail, not vice versa. Yep. So like brands like Yeti started off with high end retail and they also, you know, have some placements and like Ace Hardwares or um, they saw on Amazon. Yep. So it's going to be a fun experiment. Well, we, we've been on for 40 minutes now <laughs> and it's been absolutely fantastic. I feel like we could probably talk for another few hours, but <laughs> for the sake of our audience here, I would like to ask you one more question because this is something that I definitely struggle with and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. You're obviously very in tune with the business. You keep up with the e-commerce space. You post content, education. You're also an entrepreneur. You're building a team. You're, you know, figuring out what your future org chart is, all these things. How do you balance both? How do you stay an industry expert, but also, you know, lead your company and focus on entrepreneurial growth? Do you have any tips or resources for that? That's a really excellent question. So I, I, felt, I, I felt that very deeply. There's a concept called player, player, coach, coach, and then like GM is, is four different tiers of being a worker. And we, we started the brand. All, all three of the founders were players. We were doing everything. And then over time, we hired people to, to do things like, um, you know, create uh, shipments from China and, and things like that, respond to compliance, all sorts of things. And, and now... My role specifically, like I, I have four direct reports and, and, and they have reports as well. So I need to be a good manager and help my reports to, to know what to do. And to do that, I've, I, I've realized I have to be in Amazon ads. I have to, you know, be aware of what's, what the important things are that are driving the business. Um, I, I think, you know, thinking about it like a doctor kind of checking the vitals of, on a patient is kind of a, a good analogy for it. So that that's the role that I'm in right now. I know that uh, my, my co-founder, Mike, who's the CEO, is very much like in the coach only world. And he's yeah. kind of, you know, not, not struggled, but he's he's transitioned into figuring out, like, how do I kind of be a spokesperson and, and, and be a good manager without being in really in any tactics. Um, so it, it, it's hard for him to find that balance of being aware of everything he needs to, but also <laughs> casting vision. I, I, I think there are probably, probably things that you could relate with. <laughs> I, I'm curious. It, it sounds like you've probably had similar things in your career. How, how have you experienced it? Yeah, it it's difficult. I mean, I, I'm super passionate about everything that we're doing. And it just, there's so much to keep up with. I mean, we, we solely do media, right? We're not even focused on as much on like the operations, the supply chain side, anything like that. And I mean, there's an update weekly that we have to keep up with. So balancing both has been difficult. I think for us, it's truly been like you mentioned, building the right team below us. Anything I don't like doing or that doesn't fuel me, it's like, okay, let's find the person who does. Let's find the person that's passionate about that topic. Let's find the person who is the, you know, strengths to all my weaknesses. That's been a good thing. And I think the two things that have really helped us is we've done a lot of like different personality tests, not necessarily like the fun ones, but like the, uh, you know, the strengths test and things like that to help us see like on paper, here's what you're good at and here's what you're not. And it drives a lot of humility to be able to say, hey, you know, I know I'm not great with follow up, so I need to work more closely with this person or this person and uh, the self-awareness required to uh, grow a business quickly and to the EQ to work with a team with three founders, I'm sure. It's a, it's a journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's so true. And we've done similar things with personality tests and that, that's real. Yeah. Um, I think one other thing that I'd want to add that's been influential for us is um, 
Netflix is famous for having a cultural cultural deck, like a slide deck. Yes, it uh, sounds like fantastic. You're uh, no rules, rules is like every single person we hire gets sent that book the moment they onboard because we love their culture. They've done a. I've heard some negatives, but as a whole, we've embraced a lot of their competitive, driven, you know, high talent, a player, top grading culture. Yeah, yeah, and, and so what I was going to bring up is whenever you scale an organization, your complexity goes up over time, and most companies just want to throw bodies at the complexity or outsource it, and what Netflix preaches is really like whenever your complexity increases and your headcount increases, your talent density tends to decrease as you hire more people. But if you can match your complexity increase with your talent density, like if you keep your talent going up as well, that that's actually a driver for the organization. And that's something that we have definitely seen, like just hiring really smart people mm -hmm. to, to maybe do jobs that they're not, um, you know, formally qualified for in terms of their work history. Yep. Like they can figure out yeah. how to to do most things if they're like a talented driven person, they're going to add yes. value well beyond that role that they're hired for. So that's been like a really big key for our growth. Yeah, that's fantastic. We we went through a similar rabbit hole. <laughs> we read every single, you know, operational book, every culture book, all these different things and the Netflix one was the one that we resonated with most and I think you know, I talked about timing earlier and saying no and how it depends on what stage of the business you are in. I think another core aspect of this is your culture is built off who you are as a leader. So I could say all day long, you know, hey, I want a laid back team that only works 35 hours a week and you go do this. But if I'm working 60 to 70 hours a week because I'm driven and I'm competitive, there's going to be friction there. So making sure that you're not taking the cultures that you love the most, like Google or Netflix, but you're taking the cultures that are most aligned with who you are as a person, because that's what's going to allow you to attract talent that aligns with both of those variables. Absolutely. And, and being able to keep that team together is really important. Yeah. We've, we've maintained the, the core of our team for, for the entirety of the company. We've had a few people leave, and, and that's always going to happen. Yeah. But longevity of talented people in, in one spot, like, yeah. Uh, chances are you're going to be able to, to be successful if you can keep a, a core team together. Well, sounds like we also got to schedule in a culture and operations <laughs> podcast here, but I, I'm in. <laughs> I wanted to, again, give a huge shout out. Definitely check Brian out on LinkedIn. We'll make sure that's added. He posts amazing content, uh, regardless of how frequently you're on there. When you do post, it's good. So just wanted to thank you so much for your time, your expertise, and just say congratulations for building such an amazing brand. Thank you very much. very much. And thanks for having me on I, I, again. I, I really value and appreciate the content that you put out. Um, I, I'm definitely a beneficiary of, of seeing that myself. And I, I think that you've helped Simple Modern to be a, a better brand just from the, the content that I've read. So I, I appreciate Amazing. you. We're going to have to get some branded merch. We're going to send some out to the team, like a little co-brand here. But thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your week.